<clears throat> well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Kupferberg Holocaust Center uh, celebration. Uh, I have to apologize for the problem with air conditioning, but because of that, how do you like the rainbow we got for you? Okay, that I think took the place of that. Okay, fine. Uh, my name is Arthur Flug. I'm the director of the Kupferberg Holocaust Center. And I'm really happy that you came here. And I want you to know the reason you came here. It was not simply because this was a fundraiser and you very generously supported us. Uh, we did this to correct an omission. And before I tell you what that omission was, I'd like to call on the president of the college, Dr. Diane Cole. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you and good evening. For those of you who are new to our campus, welcome. For those of you who have been here before, welcome back. This is a very important part of our campus. We're an educational institution, and there is no better education than to offer our students the opportunity to understand what the consequences are of behavior that can range from bullying to persecution. It's very important, and you'll hear the voices of our students, which is our investment in the Holocaust Center, to give voice to the many, many horrors and the important lessons of the Holocaust. I really appreciate all of you being here. I thank you for being supporters. This is enormously important. It's important to history. It's important to the education of all the new generations coming forward. And I'm very, very proud of our students. You'll get to hear from a few of them tonight. Thank you to Pearl and Nathan. Thank you so much. You've been amazing supporters to our board members, Mark and Sandy, and, and our advisory board members, people who've been with us for years and years. The center began in 1983, and it was little known and little appreciated. And I think you're helping us recognize it, and you're helping us strengthen it, and you're helping us take it forward so that those lessons never, ever are forgotten. So I thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Cole. The reason I said <clears throat> we're having this event because of an omission, uh, that omission has taken place for more than 70 years. And I was explaining to someone uh, earlier today <clears throat> that if I say to you, <clears throat> tell me about the Holocaust in Poland, <clears throat> I will have an endless stream of information. The names of the concentration camps, <clears throat> the names of the cities, the ghettos. If I say to you, <clears throat> tell me about the Holocaust in Germany, a similar response. And in Romania, and Lithuania, and Bulgaria, you will all have a tremendous knowledge <clears throat> of what took place during World War II with the Nazi onslaught against the Jewish population. But if I say to you, <clears throat> tell me about the Holocaust in Greece, <clears throat> most of you will look at me and just taking a fairly non-scientific survey over the past year, the responses I've been getting is, <clears throat> or are, Holocaust in Greece, the most common answer that comes forward was, were there Jews living in Greece? Second question is, was there a Holocaust in Greece? And the answer is yes. <clears throat> and because it is so little known, and because <clears throat> we have been working with people such as Pearl and Nathan Halegwa, <clears throat> and have come to know what the Holocaust in Greece was, and why it is little known, we decided to help in some way to correct that. <clears throat> and early in the spring semester that recently ended, we opened an exhibit called Lost Voices, the Holocaust in Greece. Many of the people who came to the opening of the exhibit were shocked. They didn't know what happened. To follow that up, we brought together this program this evening not simply as a fundraiser, but in order to give you an understanding of what was lost. 
<clears throat> in October of this coming semester, of the fall of 2012, we're having a guest speaker, Marsha Haddad. Many of you know her, uh, expert on certain areas of the Holocaust in Greece. She will be here, and that will be followed by another presentation in the spring semester. It's an idea that we have that our function is not simply to repeat history, but also it is to educate people. And we have had a tremendous following as far as people coming in to see this exhibit on Greece. In fact, it may be very, I look at this as something with very, very personal pride. Uh, those of us who are directors of Holocaust centers <coughs> have a network and we're always communicating with each other. And I was very happy when a colleague of mine by the name of Tally Nates, N-A-T-S, who is director of <coughs> the Holocaust sent in Johannesburg, South Africa, emailed me and said, so how come you didn't send me copies of the exhibit on the Holocaust in Greece? Nobody here knows about it, and now we've spread the word from Bayside to South Africa. <clears throat> A way we have of addressing the problems of the Holocaust and the most searing problem that faces us today when we talk about the Holocaust is how do you teach the Holocaust <clears throat> without Holocaust survivors? That becomes a key issue because more than 70 years ago the Holocaust ended, our survivors are aging and slowly disappearing. We started a second G group called 2G, which is a group made up of the children of Holocaust survivors, and their function will be to tell the stories that their parents told them to students. We're also working and put, we're with a group called 3G NYC, grandchildren of Holocaust survivors, and these are people who also will be with us in making presentations to students on campus or to organizations and schools off campus. But probably the most effective way we have of preserving what took place during the Holocaust is through our students. Each semester we select anywhere between 12 to 15 students. They serve as interns at the Kupferberg Center. Their job is to meet with me once a week. We study the Holocaust, we see movies, we have discussions, we do role playing, <clears throat> and many of the students feel very uncomfortable in this internship because they're asked to make certain choices that they rather were not making. Let me give you a very simple choice. We sat down one day and everybody was in a circle. Everybody had a number. <clears throat> and I said to one of the students, I want you to stand up, reach into this envelope, pick out a piece of paper and tell what number you have. And she reached in and the number was seven. And I handed her a gun, I said, shoot number seven. And she pointed the gun at number seven and shot him. It was a toy gun. But I said, why did you do that? You told me to. You're my teacher. You're in charge of the Holocaust Center. You determine whether or not I get my stipend or not. And basically, I was following orders. Amazing, isn't it? 70 years later. And the students walked out not happy that day, simply not happy, realizing <clears throat> how easy it is to murder people. But our interns <clears throat> serve a far more important process, a far more important <clears throat> object. Uh, our students are what I begin to call insurance policies. They are each assigned to a survivor. <clears throat> they are required to interview the survivor. They are required to report back to the group with that survivor and tell them the survivor's stories. And if any of you want to see these stories when you go home tonight, <clears throat> go on YouTube, put down Kupferberg Holocaust Center interns, and you will be frightened at what you see with our students' responses, but you'll also be invigorated to know the challenge our students have taken up. I have a group of students here today with us this evening who have finished their internship, and two weeks ago they did their presentation, and I'd like them to come forward, please. That's ladies. <clears throat> okay. 
Each of these students here represent a unique part of our college that finds itself in our diversity. I think the number is always somewhere between 140 and 150 different nationalities that we have on campus and something like 60 plus languages. So when our students on campus come and interview a survivor, it's not the, well, I grew up in New York City, I grew up somewhere in the United States, I have an American background, and Dr. Flug assigned me the survivor, he taught me how to interview the survivor, and what I've done is interview the survivor. I want to introduce our interns, who if I ask them to speak briefly tonight, to give you an idea of what they've taken away from this interview. The first one, Monica. Monica Sahan. Monica is <coughs> a student. This is her first year, at, first year at Queensboro Community College. She comes with a background of a family coming from Iraq. And Monica, let me ask you, could you please? Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Monica Sirhan. I am currently entering my second year at Queensboro Community College. After an exciting first year here, I am thrilled to welcome with open arms all of the exciting new programs that lie ahead in the year to come. The most memorable of them all was my internship at the Kupferberg Holocaust Center. It was here that I met Hannah Deutsch. She is among the few Holocaust survivors to have left Germany on the kinder transport. Her endeavors through the harsh habitats that she had to go through were amazing and they molded Hannah into a woman of unimaginable strength, strength that I admire. The story of how she was able to fight through a dictatorship helped me understand more and more what my father and his family went through under the harsh regime of Saddam Hussein and being Christian Arabs in Iraq. With Ms. Deutsch's amazing story, I have new hope for the people of all countries facing political strife, including Iraq that they may overcome the suppression, just as Hannah did, and make their own dreams come true. The courage I have gained through the internship at the Kupferberg Holocaust Center and the passion for life I have developed with the help of Hannah Deutsch leaves no doubt in my mind that attending QCC will offer me opportunities that I will never reach on my own. And for that, I thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Monica. And now, Natalie Galeev, who comes with a strong background of having parents from Israel. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Natalie Galeev. I am a student at Queensborough Community College, hopefully graduating next winter. Um, this past semester, I had the pleasure of being part of the internship here at the Holocaust Center with Dr. Fluke. I met an amazing, amazing, amazing survivor. Her name was Ethel Katz, and her story inspired me. I left her house crying. Um, she turned her story into, I can't even explain, she turned it around and made it so much better for herself. She became an author. Her house is full of paintings just from memories and it's just beautiful. Uh, during this internship, Dr. Fluke taught us about what actually was going on in the Holocaust. He made us think of how one person can hate so much and everyone could go against what that, like, go with what that one person was saying. And it was really strong. As interns, we made promise to our survivors that we would forever tell their stories and make sure that it's going to be remembered and that for the generations to come won't think that this never happened and that hopefully this will never happen again. So I want to thank you all for letting us do this and thank you to the Queensborough Community College and Dr. Fluke. Our third intern is Ola Jamoki Atanda. And one of the things, before you tell your story, I have to tell you, when she got up and spoke, I never saw an intern as angry as she was. Totally angry, but listen to why she was angry. Hello, everyone. My name is Elijah Mokiatanda, but I know you can't pronounce it, so you could call me Jay. Um, I served as an intern for the Holocaust Center this spring semester, and what really touched me the most about this internship is Two years ago, if you asked me about the Holocaust, I would not know it because I grew up in Nigeria where we have no knowledge about the Holocaust. And in Nigeria today, so much ignorance is still going on. 
and ignorance is the same thing that caused the Holocaust. So it really angers me, the fact that today people are trying to understate the impact of the Holocaust. So we and my fellow interns, we serve as insurance to continue to prove the fact that the Holocaust was a truly dehumanizing effect in history and we have to continue to remember it. Thank you. And our last uh, intern, uh, Karishma Mia, uh, born in Saudi Arabia, came here in 2006. Um, next semester, unfortunately, because all of these young ladies are delightful to work with. Uh, unfortunately, next year she'll be in Barnard uh, pursuing a career in medicine. But let me introduce Karishma to you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I don't have any prepared speech because I just had an organic chemistry exam this morning <laughs> and I'm really nervous, but I'm going to reiterate what working at this center meant for me. In late February, I walked into this building that is so beautiful from the outside and so empty on the inside. And five months later, I will be walking away from this building having had one of the most momentous experiences I have ever had in my life. I met a woman named Margaret Goldberger. I've been looking for her all evening. I don't know if she's here today, no? Well, her story was so beautiful and so powerful. I'm sure even now that I will never find words to convey it to her. She is with her husband, the president of the Kinder Transport Association in America. A wonderful woman, very pleasant to work with. She taught me a lot of things. She overwhelmed me with making real what to me so far had been only a historical event. I mean, I know about my Holocaust after coming to America. I read the textbooks, I read Anne Frank's diary, I watched Chandler's List, you know the deal. But her story made for me this historical event, a reality so overwhelming, I still don't know how, how, what to make of the experience. She taught me the reality of her experience. She taught me that there are experiences, human experiences, so momentous and so big, and maybe I'm lucky or unlucky to ever only know a flicker of them. These experiences, and many more like them, will never touch me. And most importantly, she taught me that, she made me realize once again that inhumanity of the worst magnitude committed against humanity is committed by humans. And it is my responsibility and your responsibility to make sure that I am aware of this and every day in my life is dedicated towards making a difference and making a change and not perpetuating this vicious cycle of inhumanity. And most importantly, to never forget what was lost and what will always remain with us. Thank you. Ladies, thank you so much, please. And finally, what you've been waiting for, we talked and did planning for tonight's program. Uh, we could have done a traditional Holocaust program, which would have meant there would have been a choir here and a cantor here and some other groups uh, going into a type of dirge. What we wanted to do was have the people walk out with the realization, not wringing their hands and say, oh my God, what happened to the Jewish people? What happened to my aunts and uncles? We wanted people to come out of here understanding what was lost, what was lost, the things that we cherished most, the things that were memories, the songs, the melodies, the meals, everything that was lost. And in putting this together, we worked that theme through. And tonight, for our program, our presentation, we have Bas Yashekta, Pharaoh's daughter. So part of the culture from Greece that was lost, but is also still continued, is the language of Ladino, 
Do a lot of he people here speak Ladino? Yes. Um, maybe something a little more hopeful is to know that a quality that is passed down from generation to generation, mostly among women, is the quality of mothers and grandmothers wanting to get their daughters and granddaughters married. Is that something that's a familiar? In this tradition, in Ladino, um, there's a song dedicated solely to this, to this uh, mission of a mother whose mission it is to get her daughter married. And so she takes matters into her own hands and says, hey, daughter, what about this tall guy? He's amazing, wonderful. And the daughter says, oh, my god, I'm, uh, my neck, it hurts when I look up at him. Ah. And, well, what about this short guy? And she's like, oh, my god, my back. I have to kiss him. Oh, my god, it's going to be so hard. And finally, the mother says, well, I know this one last guy. He's the last one. There's no one left. He's a little bit drunk. What about him? Daughter says, Mom, I think you're on to something. <laughs> One, two, three, go. Te voy a dar un hermoso, no quiero madre, no quiero que el hermoso yo no lo gozo, no quiero madre, no quiero que el hermoso yo no lo gozo, no quiero madre, no quiero. Mi querida, te voy a dar un alto. No quiero madre, no quiero. Y él es alto, yo no lo canso. No quiero madre, no quiero. Que él es alto, yo no lo canso. No quiero madre, no quiero. Carida te voy a dar un bajo, no quiero madre, no quiero que él es bajo, salas un bajo, no quiero madre, no quiero que él es bajo, salas un bajo, no quiero madre, no quiero. Mi querida, te voy a dar un borracho, ya quiero madre, ya quiero que yo borracho, ya ya me paso, ya quiero madre, ya quiero que yo borracho, yo ya me paso, ya quiero madre, ya quiero. Oh.
Yo pari da da do. Yo pari da da do. Thank you. This is a song that celebrates the freedom with, uh, with the image of the Yona, which is a dove. And for this song, we're going to fill up the space. And we're going to celebrate freedom and movement and the continuity. And the line that you're going to sing and fill up the space with goes like this. Whoa, ho, ho, ho. Try that. Whoa, ho, ho. Beautiful. So every time after I sing it, you sing it. Something that's very interesting is that this group is part of Pharaoh's Daughter, but it's the version of Pharaoh's Daughter called Queen's Dominion. And uh, we're in Queens, <laughs> right? And we're about to invite a guest up who's, who's 
company is called Belly Queen. And so we thought this was, what? We're going to do a song called Bedouin Tea Party, which um, represents the movement of the diaspora through the desert. So we're going to see a little bit of all the cultures, the Indian culture, the Sephardic culture, the Mediterranean culture, all those cult cultures. And just imagine them all having a little tea party together in the desert. Hey, 
Shi Chai. And I thought it'd be good to do a song that I think you guys might know. Does everybody here um, know a lot of Ladino songs? Yes. Um, we thought we'd do one that um, you would probably know pretty well. Do you know the song Adio? Okay, so this song you have to sing along with us. Now, for those of you who don't know this song, before we get to it, I wanted to share with you some of the words. Part of the Ladino, the Sephardic tradition, is to sing songs that are incredibly sad and lots of drama, intense. I mean, I'm just going to read this. This is really, really intense. When your mother delivered you and brought you to the world, <laughs> she did not give you a heart to love with. <laughs> Goodbye. I'm sorry, this is terrible. Okay. <laughs> Goodbye, beloved. I don't want to live. You made my life miserable. <laughs> <laughs> I'll go look for another love. Knock on other ports. In hope. There is a true hope. Because for me, you are dead. <laughs> yeah, it's very subtle. That's what... <laughs> And, uh, and we're going to definitely need your help singing this to get all the pathos. Adio, adio, querida. No quiero la vida, me la me gratis tú. Adiós, adiós querida, no quiero la vida, me la me gratis tú. Madre cuando te parió y te quitó al mundo, corazón ya no te dio para amar segundo, corazón ya te dio para amar segundo. Gratis to 
no quiero la vida me la me gratis tú Um, well, we want to do another song that uh, actually connects very, very closely to this theme. That, um, let me just, this is, it's like using your guitar like a baton. We're going to do a song now by a, a singer whose name is Rosa Ashkenazi. Does anybody know her? Now, Rosa Ashkenazi was a Greek singer. She came from Turkey, and she grew up, um, she was born 1895, 1897, but even back then, she lied. She said, grew up, she was born 1910. <laughs> See, yeah, I was born in 1985. <laughs> so, um, that's a common situation. Um, now, her story is very interesting. She, she, um, she was a Jewish family, and she became a singer, and she, was, she had one of the most beautiful canary voices. And, um, and she became very, very well-known, and she was very beloved. And actually, during the Holocaust, she was partly saved because her lover was a German officer. Now, through this... Through this, she didn't just save herself. She saved hundreds, I think she saved hundreds of people because of this connection that she had. And um, she eventually actually did get arrested. And um, she, she, didn't, uh, she didn't go away for, she, didn't, she wasn't arrested for long, but she realized she actually had to go underground after that and she survived the war. And um, her story, her life story, is memorialized in a movie called, what? Oh, called The Canary, right? My Sweet Canary. My sweet canary. Um, her, because her voice was like a canary's. So we're gonna sing, <coughs> are, are there any Greek speakers here? Kalispera sas. <laughs> Say it again? Kalispera sas. <laughs> Megan, Megan Gould, who's not in the program, but an amazing, an amazing, amazing, amazing musician, is also a Greek expert. Um, so we're going to do a song together um, called Canarini, which is a song about her being like a canary, like a voice of a canary. And this one we prepared just for this event. <coughs>
Um, the next piece we're going to do um, is called Bed. Um, this, no, we did that one already. Is called Burning Bush. And what's interesting about this song is that we perform in many different communities. And one time we were actually asked to perform in an Orthodox Jewish community, and but they said you cannot sing. So I said, okay, cannot sing. We'll do instrumental songs. So this was one of the songs that we did. Was an instrumental song, and. The thing that was very interesting about the song was that at one point in the song, there's three girls in the front, and we all go like this in the microphone. So that's part of the song. So we realized that was totally okay. <laughs> the Gemara, the Talmud, never, never conceived of women heavy breathing into a microphone <laughs> as a possible problem. <laughs> so this piece is called Burning Bush, and we again, we're going to invite our wonderful, beautiful dancer, Keishi Chai, to come up for this song.
Thank you. Is there a Jerry Hadoum in? Yeah, that's you. Could you come up and help us out with this piece? Jerry. 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 <laughs> come stand near me. Right here. We're going to do just till here. Together. If you, if we're gonna do it together, and we're doing a key a little bit, a little bit lower than yours. Okay. And dicho. This is a song that uh, that apparently is um, from your community. Which synagogue? The Stephanie Synagogue in Cedarhurst. In Cedarhurst. How many people here belong to that synagogue? Nobody. Nobody. So it's from. I comes back from New I was raised in Brooklyn, in East New York, and it was a very Sephardic community. There were three synagogues. There was the, um, the Castor Elise, the Angel Elise, and the Monastery Elise. And um, the rabbi there was Rabbi Marin, who is still the rabbi at the Cedarhurst Temple in Cedarhurst um, for the past 50 years. We can. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> with me in the old neighborhood. Uh, and this Vendicho is really uh, was carried forward from Turkey, and because uh, my parents came from Chernakali, and my grandmother came from Kasturia, and uh, this was takes place in the synagogue um, when they open the ark. It's really in Hebrew, it's Barech Hashem, and this is the Ladino version. It's going to be a little different than the one, but I learned it from Jerry. Oh. <laughs> so I've never seen you, but I've heard your voice. And I also need to look on because I know the words less than you do. Okay. <laughs> um. Bendicho su nombre, Señor del mundo. Bendicha su corona, su luar. Sea su voluntad con su pueblo Israel para siempre y resgate tu tu derecha a mostrar tu pueblo en casa de tu santidad. Y para so traer a nos de puenta de tu claridad y por recibir muestras de filón piadades se voluntad de la de ti que alargas a nos vidas con bien y por ser nosotros tus siervos guardándonos entre los justos por apiadar a nos y por guardar a nos y a todo lo que no nos 
y lo que a tu pueblo Israel, tus los que mantienes a todos y gobernas a todos. Two, one more time. Yeah. Two. Tú sos que mantienes a todos y gobernas a todos. Thank you. Thank you. So we're just going to do a few more pieces. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to do something in Greek, another Greek piece. Uh, this is part of um, Smyrnica's it's a type of music. Here we go again. Oh, 
ευγάπ στο παρατήρι τα μάλα και ασώνα δυο μα δυο γιατί θα τρελαθώ Thank you so much. We have one last song. I want to thank uh, so much. I want to thank Pearl Halegua for organizing this event. I want to thank Arthur Flug for helping and inviting us and organizing. I want to thank all of you for contributing to this amazing cause. It sounds like such a beautiful project and such a beautiful experience and such a beautiful way to, um, to celebrate this heritage, which is, you know, it's not, it's not, it's getting lost in some ways, and in some ways we're trying to preserve it through music, through art, and, um, and thank you for being here for that. Um, we're gonna end with a song, is there anybody here who's a Greek dancer? There's no Greek dancers. The whole Greek thing, okay, it just, <laughs> so, 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 no, so no Greek dancing. But we're, okay, so we're going to end them with a song uh, in Ladino. Another song, again, with a the theme of uh, marriage and men and women. In this story, it's a man, and he's trying to fight for this woman's love and devotion. And this is not just one man fighting this woman's devotion. It's two men. And one man says, I have just the thing that's going to make you mine. I'm going to give you a wedding ring. He's like, okay, well, that's interesting. <laughs> and the other guy says, wait, I have the thing that's going to make you want to marry me. And he says, I have a wedding dress. So that's nice. Basically, she says, you guys are just really silly boys. It's not going to happen. That's really the end of the song. A lot of Ladino songs. <laughs> <laughs> Like, some of them are completely so intense and so deep. <laughs> Did you notice the difference? <laughs> and some songs are like this, where the text is just like, all right, <laughs> fun. So we'll end on a fun note. Um, just so as you know, just uh, an interesting thought on the burning bush. Is that from the burning bush that we were talking about before in a few songs prior? This song is, this song is called Ven Hermosa. And uh, what's interesting about the burning bush is that from the burning bush, the voice of God speaks out to Moses and tells him, tells him what his mission in the world is going to be. I think right now in this world, it's not always so easy to find the voice within ourselves that's going to explain or express to us just what our mission in this world is. And sometimes we have to listen really, really, really in a quiet space or in a separate space or a devoted space. But that voice is very important. And though this song is very silly, it's dedicated to that voice in our lives that's going to give us our direction for the rest of our lives. And uh, thank you very much for being here. And this is called Ven Hermosa in Ladino as well. Then there's 
zoro benkoni Ken mi padre yasku yumji Ken te zoro benkoni Ken mi padre yasku yumji Tivo 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 da Tivo 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 da Turkish Greek dancing right here. Dos hermosos y yo soy. Que mi gusto en vosot. Dos hermosos y yo soy. Que mi gusto en vosot. Dos hermosos y yo soy. Que mi gusto en vosot. Dos hermosos y yo soy. Mi gusto en vos Si me, si me hará yo Tivo, tivo, tivo da We have Rich Stein on percussion. <laughs> Megan Gould on violin. <laughs> Alan Kushan on the Santor. <laughs> Keishi Chai on dance. Thank you all. Thank you all so very much. Closing statement that I'd just like to point out. For the past three weeks, every morning, about 9.15, the telephone rings and says, Arthur, did you remember to do this? And I said, yes, dear. Did you remember to do that? Did you call this? And I said, yes, dear. And after about two hours of yes, dear, so I'm not talking to my wife. I'm talking... <laughs> I'm talking to Pearl, and, and it's like having a second wife, but one of the things that is absolutely amazing working with Pearl is you know that when Pearl signs on to do something, it's not only going to get done, but it's going to get done in a way that's never ever been done before. Pearl and I have something in common. We're both teachers. We both had a career in teaching, and one of the, if you walk into my office, there's a sign that most people look at and roll their eyes, but it's really been effective, and Pearl and I operate this way. The sign says, it's not really important that your students remember what you taught them. What is important is they never forget what you taught them. And tonight when you go home, no one will ever forget what was lost in Greece because of that. Pearl, I'd like you to come up right over here for a minute. And we'd like to present you with some flowers. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, you want a music stand, right? Yeah.
Uh, Pearl said, have a music stand ready for me. Can I borrow this, please? Sure, sure. Let me Right height. Go ahead, Pearl. Pearl, here you are. You know, I spend, we go out to we go to a wedding or whatever, and you dance online and go home. I say, oh, I'm really out of shape. This is the first time I sat through a musical performance and said, I couldn't even <gasps> that off without hyperventilating. And forget watching that the dance. <laughs> I would never be able to get up off the floor, but not, let alone her stomach, but the movement of her arms, the fluidity, and I, it's just amazing. And as you can see, thank you for restoring the voice into those lost voices for us tonight. You were marvelous, and we really appreciate it. And what was really touching was that Alan, Ezra, um, one of the pictures were, was of his family. So that was a connection that was... Uh, Page 23. Page 23. <laughs> um, many have asked me how I became involved with the center. I met Dr. Flug. You can't hear me? Okay. After thir 25 years of teaching, you think I can project. But, you know, I'm free tired. I met Dr. Flug, our director, while working on a crystal knot program committee at Queens College. Arthur was our keynote speaker. He spoke about how we have been good at remembering the atrocities of the Shoah, but now has come the time when we must also focus on ensuring never again. And the only way that's going to happen is through education. That is the game changer. Sustainable change starts with education. I asked Arthur, sorry, I asked Arthur if he would come to my temple to do a workshop for students in our Hebrew school. He says that's what he does. He travels wherever he is invited to teach. I asked how much for the workshop, and he said a cup of hot coffee and a Danish. Arthur's dedication and energy are immeasurable and he moves around so fast that I believe he just might sustain himself on coffee. But it takes a lot more than a hot cup of coffee and a Danish to keep this building functioning. That is why we want to thank you for your support this evening. Thank you for contributing to the building fund, Satyrs for our survivors, supporting our intern program, and, sponsor and sponsoring future lectures. Your support for tonight's event has made it possible for us to hold two lectures next year, both free and open to the public. Each will look at the Jews of Greece through a different lens. And we're putting a calendar together and we will be sending them out to you, so make sure we have your mailing address. On a personal note, I want to thank my friends from Temple Beth Shalom, and from Roslyn for joining us tonight. Members of, I get a little for Clint about these people. They're just so wonderful. The best friends. I'll move on. Okay. Members of the fun board of Queensboro Community College and Mark Kupferberg and his family for their vision. I want to thank my cousin Simon Halegwa, who is spending his birthday with us. Happy birthday, Simon. And thank you and your family for helping make this event happen. And I want to thank Auntie Jermaine, who wasn't able to make it tonight, a woman of valor from Salonica, for her strength and love served as a role model of how one can rebuild his or her life after all that is dear and precious has been stripped away. We need places like this building and we need educators like Arthur so that future generations will be inspired to not let the horror in this history that we've talked about tonight repeat itself. The work of the Harriet and Kenneth Kupferberg Holocaust Resource Center and Archives has been recognized for its excellence. The National Endowment for the Humanities, or NEH, awarded the center a $500,000 challenge grant where for each $2 raised by the center, the NEH will award us $1.
You know, our belly dancer is a motivational speaker without words. I had a belly dancer at my wedding. Yes, I really did. Something that was not arranged by me and therefore was a complete shock and a surprise. That was my first exposure to the Turkish influence on Sephardic culture. There were other things, but that one stood out. This lovely woman danced, and all the men got up and threw dollars at her, and then she gave them to me. Unfortunately, they told me it was inappropriate to do that here tonight. <laughs> but if you want to help us reach our challenge, we have a gift for you this evening, a zakhor pin. A zakhor means to remember in Hebrew. And if you wish to throw us a donation for it, you don't have to, but if you're inclined to do so, please think in even numbers. Because remember, the challenge is $1 for every two that we raise. Thank you again for coming. Get home safe. And as my in-laws would say, vaya con Dios. Thank you, Pearl. There's one other person I'd like to call up, uh, Patricia Thomas. And in closing, I'd like to say the only words I know in Greek. Please join us for dessert. Thank, thank you. <laughs>